All right, everyone, we are gonna get uh, started with our breakout session. My name is Bob Crookton. I'm a uh, board member, actually vice chair of the, of the board of directors here at the ABTA, been a long time volunteer for over 25 years. Uh, so welcome to all of you. I am uh, very pleased to, to start this session and uh, it is uh, entitled Treating My Tumor. You may have wondered uh, in your journey, what are the key questions to ask your doctor uh, when you're receiving active treatment for a brain tumor or a spine tumor? This session is going to cover critical topics for patients who are either newly diagnosed or in an active treatment phase. So we're honored to have our speaker here today, Dr. Ashley Gia Satan, uh, who is a neuro, uh, neuro-oncologist and chief of the Division of Neuro-Oncology in the Department of Neurosurgeon, uh, Neurosurgery at the University of Florida in Gainesville, also by way of the University of Notre Dame. Dr. Gia Seddon specializes in brain cancer treatment using targeted methods including chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and precision medicine for patients with malignant brain tumors such as glioblastoma. Please let's give a hearty welcome to Dr. Gia Seddon. Thanks, Bob, and thanks uh, ABTA as well as the organizing chairs for inviting me to give this discussion. What I hope I can do over the next 45 minutes or so is try to show you how we approach uh, a patient when they have a new diagnosis, what questions are important for you to be asking uh, when you have that diagnosis, and what are some of the treatment considerations that you should be making as a patient or caregiver, and what the physicians are thinking when they're talking uh, you know, with patients about those therapies. So I think it's helpful to kind of get an idea of what we think about as well as what you should be asking when you're seeing um, your, your physician. So I'll just get started here. These are my disclosures. And what I'd like to just start with is when we think about brain tumors, we wanna discuss primary versus secondary. And primary brain tumors are cancers that are starting within the brain and made up of brain tissue. I will spend this talk speaking mainly about adult type diffuse gliomas, but there are secondary brain tumors as well. And those are metastatic cancers that spread from other sites of the body. And common sites would include the lung, breast, or spreading from melanoma. What are the common symptoms? Headaches new onset, typically wake someone up in the morning, that's where they're most severe, typically will improve throughout the day. Seizures, in about a third of our patients. Weakness, we usually will say it's a focal weakness, so weakness on one side of the body, much of what you would see with a stroke. Speech difficulty, confusion, and the more aggressive types of brain tumors will have rapidly developing symptoms. What causes our primary brain tumors? Well, we don't have a lot of answers. We need to do better and really start to understand what are causes that uh, lead to a primary brain tumor diagnosis. But what we can say is environmentally high doses of ionizing radiation is the only proven risk factor. So think of atomic bomb survivors or uh, children who were diagnosed with ALL and received radiation. Back in the 1950s and 60s, they were using radiation for tinea capitis, uh, a dermatologic condition of the scalp that was receiving treatment with uh, low doses of radiation. Other exposures have really been inconclusive. We think of occupational pesticides, cell phones have been in the news, but none of these have really showed us any uh, you know, high degree of concern. So those studies have largely been inconclusive, and we can't draw anything from those. Familial glioma cases, where you see in families, are really less than 5%. It is possible to occur in families without known predisposing uh, hereditary diseases, and that could suggest environmental causes. The genetic risk factors that we think of are conditions such as neurofibromatosis, tuberous sclerosis, von Hippel-Lindau, Lee-Fromani, and these are a cancer predisposing syndrome. So that's a condition where multiple family members 
typically at younger ages have been diagnosed with several different types of cancers that cluster within the family. How do we know if someone has a brain tumor? Well, when someone is first diagnosed, it's done usually through neuroimaging, and that's either through a CT head without contrast or with and without contrast, and an MRI brain. The CT that people get is quick, it's fast, it can tell you if there's acute blood. It's not as detailed as MRI, but it's available at many places. MRI brain is gonna be taking a little bit longer for the test to get done, and there's usually gadolinium enhancement that's given to uh, specifically look for blood-brain barrier disruption. There's also testing such as perfusion that's done as well. Uh, and then PET imaging is another uh, modality that's been in the news recently. People have really thought about uh, using this as well for amino acid PET uh, specifically has had some promise, but it's not standardized yet. You do need a minimum size of lesion uh, and not everywhere has this capability. Tissue is still the standard. So once you make a radiologic diagnosis, you really need that tissue to help determine what exactly is the primary brain tumor you're dealing with so that you can make informed treatment decisions. Primary brain tumors are graded. They are graded one through four. Uh, it's rare for primary brain tumors to go outside of the brain or spinal cord. Grade one is the least aggressive with grade four being the most aggressive. Grade one is typically seen in childhood and we have historically referred to this as being benign but I would caution and remind you that benign tumors can still cause trouble based on the location and the operability. Grade three and grade four are what we commonly term as malignant brain tumors. And the grading really helps determine treatment options as well as prognosis. For adult type diffuse gliomas, we think of them as astrocytomas, oligodendrogliomas, and glioblastoma. With the new WHO grade classification that came out in 2021, glioblastomas by definition were defined as having IDH wild type status. The IDH mutated tumors can be separated into astrocytoma and oligodendroglioma, and they are graded slightly differently. The astrocytomas can be graded two through four, and the oligodendrogliomas are graded two through three. So you may start thinking, what are my options for treating my glioma? Well, with grade one, we commonly think of surgery, if possible, being the best option. And radiation and or chemotherapy when surgery is not possible. With a grade two glioma, surgery, considering radiation and or chemotherapy if the surgery is not complete or feasible, and also depending on patient risk factors, but then also targeted treatments have now really been pushed as a promising, relevant treatment, depending on their IDH status. Uh, Vorocytinib was recently FDA approved to be given for patients who have surgical resection, uh, followed by um, their IDH mutated diagnosis to then receive this medication. And that has had promise to delay chemo radiation for those patients. And then grade three, four tumors, typically surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy form the backbone of those treatments. Although targeted treatments, as I mentioned in grade two, has also come as a uh, very important option for those patients that are IDH mutated. The performance status is gonna determine whether or not radiation is given only and or chemotherapy can be used in combination. And performance status, really comes in the form of what we call the KPS or Karnofsky performance status. Is my brain tumor curable? Think of it as local and systemic control. So local control being surgery, radiation, stereotactic radiosurgery, even laser therapy has been used for difficult to access tumors where you can't remove the tumor so that you can still offer some sort of cytoreductive therapy. Systemic control can be used for chemotherapy, biological therapy, or immunotherapy. For diffuse gliomas, the treatment intent is really to control disease. You will hear the term stable being used in visits, and that is because it is very difficult to use a term curative when you're looking at a tumor that we discuss as really being more of grains of sand and not really a grape and jello. You can't just remove it 
from the brain and say all of it is gone with a high degree of confidence. There may be still little tentacles or microscopic cells that we don't see, but if the scans are not changing, you have received treatment, we feel very comfortable that the tumor is stable, it's quiet, it's not doing anything, and it's more of a long-term uh, game where we're following you over, um, over a lifetime to make sure this isn't growing or causing any trouble. Why is the treatment so difficult? Really because infiltration of the tumor cells into normal brain tissue. It makes it very difficult to just trying to remove more and more tissue because we don't want to leave people with deficits uh, or neurologic symptoms that really impact your quality of life. Recurrence is always a concern in transforming to a higher grade, as well as rapid growth that can cause swelling, increased pressure, and microscopic disease that we discussed on the previous uh, slide. What should I do at my first clinic visit after surgery? So this is when you're coming in to see the neuro-oncologist. Here you would review pathology and determine a treatment plan. You're gonna discuss the natural disease course to set expectations and review potential clinical trial options. Clinical trials are recommended in glioblastoma, though we wanna consider really important things for patients and their caregivers, and that is the financial implications of both cost and travel, as well as how that disrupts the caregiver and, and really family life. Standard treatment is determined by the functional status to help inform options. And then alternative treatment options may or may not be discussed. Typically they are, and that's complementary medicine, that is the treatments outside of the standard therapy that you know, may or may not benefit. And off-label medication use is considered at times, including immunotherapy. Although it's important to know that that may impact future treatment implications. Certain clinical trials may exclude you if you've already had immunotherapy in the past. That, that, that's not a reason to not try something different or novel, but it's just a consideration that uh, we want patients and their families to know before they start on something that's off-label or complementary. The treatment plans. Well, we talked about really our goals of treatment being control. And it's important to note that some patients may and their families talk about when there's something aggressive, why do I do treatment? What is really the, uh, the effect on, on me personally? Am I gonna be able to tolerate it? Am I gonna be sick? I always like to make sure I you know, specify that the decline that people have is normally related to the tumor progression and less often the side effects that are related to treatment. There are side effects to treatment but we do have good medicine and support to help minimize the side effects that people are experiencing. Our biggest concerns happen to be with tumor progression. Symptoms that you should expect, and hopefully we can do very well to minimize, would be fatigue, but physical and occupational therapy can benefit. Nausea and vomiting, but there are good anti-nausea protocols. Liver and kidney functions, and that's why we check labs we talk about lifestyle and dietary habits, as well as possible medication uh, use that may be contributing to some of those abnormalities. Bone marrow suppression really requires frequent lab checks. And sometimes you have to have a treatment pause or dose modification. Rash is a rare uh, side effect, but you may have to pause treatment and use steroids. Now think about the first visit tissue results, they're now final, and you're planning for chemoradiation. The timing of starting chemoradiation is really determined by biopsy and the resection status. So if there's a biopsy only case, usually we wanna start treatment within one to two weeks. If they've had a surgery, then treatment may be three to six weeks. Our treatment is determined by the, the grade of the tumor, the patient's age, and how well they're doing afterwards, their functional status. And the radiation treatment can be with concurrent chemotherapy. It could be with radiation alone or chemotherapy alone. And there's sometimes upfront targeted therapy as well, as we talked about with the IDH mutated tumors, a targeted approach prior to chemoradiation may be very reasonable. 
How often do I have checkups? During chemo radiation, the clinic visits are typically every two to three weeks, and labs are normally done weekly. After radiation is completed, you may be taking chemotherapy for six to 12 months. There may be monthly visits and labs that are every two to four weeks. If there's no further active treatment, then the imaging, which is dependent on the grade, may be every two to three months for the first 12 to 24 months, with the duration of imaging increasing over time with the eventual goal that patients receive a lifelong imaging, but that may be every nine to 12 months. When do I consider a clinical trial? At initial diagnosis, and this discussion may take place pre or immediately post-operatively after surgery, prior to starting chemo radiation. And the reason why we think about clinical trials immediately before or after surgery is because the standard treatment is not good enough for the majority of patients, and clinical trials are always recommended. It does not mean that you could go through standard treatment and not have a good outcome. Obviously, we want that, but we know for the more aggressive tumor types, our patients need something a little bit more, and we're always constantly and striving, hopeful that we can get more better treatments for our patients. At recurrence, there, no, there is no best standard treatment for recurrence, and clinical trials are strongly recommended. And what if there are no trials available at my center? And that may happen. You can ask your provider if you know of any available clinical trials. However, I would strongly advocate that you connect with the national patient advocacy organizations. And I've, lifted, I've listed a few, which includes the ABTA, the Sontag Foundation Brain Tumor Network, National Brain Tumor Society, there's the End Brain Cancer Initiative. There are many of these wonderful organizations that their sole purpose is to help patients and their families. So I strongly encourage that you're in contact with them because they also have ties, uh, collaboration, and uh, opportunities within a lot of centers where they know about the treatments that are coming because they stay plugged in with those centers, know what's happening and can sometimes even, you know, with a patient's permission, talk about, you know, in this case, do you think they may be eligible? We have a patient that's potentially eligible and kind of fast track patients into, into clinic. When should I get a second opinion? I don't think there's a right answer. Second opinions are always welcomed, but I would limit your consultations, your second opinions to one to two uh, providers really to avoid treatment delays. I think sometimes we get analysis by paralysis and, you know, paralysis by analysis, I should say, uh, getting so much information that we're still trying to make a decision as to where to go, what should I do. And I would remind you that the neuro-oncology community is very small. Apart from available clinical trials, the treatment options are, are limited in that there's, you know, a few that people will do outside of trials, outside of precision medicine, so I don't think that there is a large amount of variability to have someone go across the country to get treatment somewhere else, where maybe close to home is the best option for them and their family at that moment. You need to consider travel and financial constraints, and again, decide, where do I want my treatment? You know, do you have family? Are you also taking care of others that make it difficult for you to travel. I didn't want to spend the whole time talking about primary brain tumors, so I just wanted to highlight brain metastasis as well. There are 200,000 patients living with cancer diagnosed with brain metastasis annually, and the incidence is increasing in lung, breast, and melanoma. Treatment is often dictated by the primary disease site, so where the tumor was originally found, where the cancer was originally found, that will often dictate what treatment is offered. But surgical resection, if it's feasible, and a solitary lesion followed by stereotactic radiosurgery is a common approach that's used. Whole brain radi radiation versus stereotactic radiosurgery really is dependent on institutional experience and the number of brain metastases that are identified. However, I will say that as SRS has really become more prevalent and providers are gaining experience. They have really tried to uh, 
increase the number of brain metastases allowed to still go with SRS to help avoid whole brain radiation or delay it. And there's always clinical trial options to consider. Although the difference between brain metastasis and primary brain tumors is the, the limit, limitations on uh, clinical trials that are available. And that's because historically patients with brain metastasis were excluded from participating in clinical trials due to concerns of their functional status, unfortunately life expectancy, and the toxicity. And those trials restricting eligibility uh, for patients who had treated or stable brain metastasis uh, have, have caused some issues because the patient population studied may not represent the population that ultimately receives the intervention. You have concerns for translating the efficacy, how, how effective the treatment is, and toxicity from a study to real-world population because we know our real-world population of patients may have brain metastasis and get this treatment. So really a plug to encourage the community to design clinical trials that are more inclusive of all patients and not be very restrictive to a select number of patients because they can harm our translation of real world population at that point. Clinical efficacy in patients with brain metastasis may lead to accelerated approval, breakthrough therapy designation, and the eligibility criteria really needs to designate brain metastasis as either treated or treated and stable, active, and leptomeningeal disease. And to highlight what those really mean, treated stable is defined by CNS-directed intervention for brain metastasis, and there is stable CNS disease. Active is defined as newer progressive brain metastasis that has not received CNS intervention since the progression onset. And LMD, or leptomeningeal disease, is defined by having positive CSF cytology, so cancer cells in the spinal fluid, or clear radiographic or clear clinical evidence of leptomeningeal involvement. Clinical trials are a dynamic process. They may be available today, but they may not be open tomorrow. There are always new studies that are being developed for future enrollment. It's a collaborative approach, but we always encourage patients and their families to talk with their healthcare providers, whether it's neuro-oncologist, a medical oncologist, radiation oncologist, your surgeon, to get their opinion on what treatment may be right for you in the setting of, of progression. And that further treatment may involve precision medicine versus immunotherapy versus even conventional therapy, radiation or surgery. And it's important to know the centers of excellence and collaborating with your care tumor and I think care team, and I think that's the importance of having uh, some collaboration with our patient care organizations because they know the centers of excellence as well. They work with them, they reach out, and they know what's going on at the centers in terms of research, clinical trial availability, and that can be great resources um, that are developed specifically for patients. And I've highlighted um, the ABTA site as well for. Uh, finding a Brain Tumor Center, which I, is a wonderful website. If you haven't visited, please do. I'll remind you that this is a journey uh, for clinical trials, and it starts with a diagnosis. Then there's a referral. There's a pre-screening process, so there's a review of the medical records to understand if the patient may meet trial criteria. Then there's an informed consent process to protect our patients and their well-being. Then there's screening, you know, understand the tests and evaluate, are they, uh, are they a good candidate for this? And then there may be randomization if it's a controlled trial, and then the patient particip participates in the trial. So as you can see, it is a long process. It's a dynamic and ongoing process for patients to go on these therapies. Much of primary brain tumors, cancer in general, has moved towards molecular profiling and that's really going beyond the histologic tissue results. And histology, when it's unable to differentiate tumors, molecular proof profiling can reduce the variability and improve accuracy of your diagnosis. It can also inform the clinical trial determination and reduce timing on whether or not patients will qualify. You can enroll patients that more closely resemble each other so that you can have results that translate to real world uh, findings and it provides a potential for precision medicine. How do we incorporate molecular profiling to treatment planning 
really determines on the timing of when you get this information. So tumor tissue after surgery is gonna be sent for molecular profiling. And then those results may take four to six weeks. That's a little bit on the long end, but I'm trying to give you conservative timelines. There's some places that maybe in three to four weeks they can get those results. There's in-house sequencing capabilities, so that means the institution itself is doing the profiling versus having an outside vendor, and that's where you hear of companies like Keras or Foundation Medicine, to name a few, or Tempest. The timing of the molecular profiling results, unless it's used for clinical trial eligibility determination in newly diagnosed clinical trials, it's really used to inform the prognosis and identify molecular alterations that may be driver mutations and serve as targets at recurrence. So that's your EGFR amplification, BRAF fusions, or NTRAC fusions as well, to name a few. I'll highlight here, the slide I put up is to show you that targeted approaches for primary brain tumors is not something that we're hoping for in the future, but it's something that's happening now. So if you think of some of our lower grade uh, gliomas, the BRAF V600E mutation, those targeted approaches are happening now. The IDH mutation, you know, we are using these medications in the clinic now to help patients. And there are several others that, you know, through initial trials that have had some positive results, people are using to give patients more opportunity uh, to try something that may impact their tumor through precision medicine. And to highlight the importance of how molecular profiling can improve diagnosis, I, I bring this case up where a patient at our institution had a non-enhancing uh, tumor that you can see on the right side, very subtle uh, flare. Uh, this is non-enhancing brightness on the left side. So when we look at our MRIs, it's a flipped image. So, uh, you know, you may look and say it's on the right, but it's actually the left side of the brain. But there is this subtle abnormality there, and they had surgical resection where there was no clear histologic evidence of a high-grade tumor. So we look at things like vessel proliferation. There's a lot of blood vessels or necrotic disease. We didn't see any of that. But mutations through molecular profiling for EGFR and TERP promoter were identified. So with the new WHO-grade classification, this patient had a glioblastoma, and it allowed them to enroll in a newly diagnosed clinical trial, highlighting the importance of why we need to be moving in this direction. What are the goals of treatment? We want to provide disease control with reasonable quality of life. We want to ensure our patients receive support and connect it to resources during their active treatment and survivorship, and really partner with patients in their care team, putting the patient at the center. Some of the additional questions to consider when you're visiting with your doctor and talking about your upcoming treatment, I think important things to ask are what percentage of your patients is devoted to brain tumor care? What that's getting at, is your provider involved with brain metastasis, primary brain tumors, do they do some neurology on the side or they do other, they treat other tumors and they only treat a small amount of brain tumors? What is the treatment recommendation and why? Is it because it's the standard? Is it because you have a clinical trial? Are you offering me something differently because of my performance status or how I'm functioning? What are my risk benefits to treatment? What if I delay treatment to postpone chemotherapy and radiation or seek a second opinion? And that kind of gets at how much time do I have before I really need to get started? I tell patients with a high grade, so with a glioblastoma, that we really want to treat you three to five weeks after your surgery. We don't want to wait too long. Um, that's the ideal. Uh, sometimes patients want to get other opinions, so I say please make your decision within the first three weeks because it may take a week for the radiation oncologist after they see you to do the planning for the treatment. So it can't be I want to get in to see the radiation oncologist and it was week five because now we're getting towards the, the time where we say, listen, if we don't want to you know, cause detriment to your to your overall treatment. What are the side effects that I should expect, both short and long term? And that gets at, you know, what side effects long term do we have with the chemotherapy? What side effects do we have from radiation? How will I know the treatment is working? What are you doing to determine 
is my treatment effective? Do you think I'm having progression? And how do you use the MRIs? How will I know that the cancer has returned or progressed? And who is in charge of my care? Is it the neuro-oncologist, is it the radiation oncologist, or the neurosurgeon? And that may depend on where you are in your treatment. If it's before surgery, then the neurosurgeon's in charge. If it's a brain metastasis and you're going in for treatment of your, of your brain metastasis and maybe the radiation oncologist. If you have a primary brain cancer and you're now finished with surgery and you're about to start treatment, it may be the neuro-oncologist. But those are great questions to be asking so you know who do I go to when I have an issue. And I end it with you know, a quote that I saw at a meeting uh, maybe about a year ago, and it really stuck with me, and I think it's important for people to really, you know, get behind this wording. And we have really, in medicine, talked about, you know, how to improve our communication and the words we use. Everyone, you know, sees their own notes now, so it's very important to be mindful of the way you're, you're speaking. And I think it's, I think it's important for, for our mindset to be, patients don't fail treatment. The treatments fail patients. And what we need to do is make better treatments for our patients. With that, I'll thank you and open it up for questions and appreciate your attention and time. Uh, if you do have a question, let me know. Raise your hand. I'll bring you the microphone. Do you have any questions? In one of your earlier slides, um, you referenced different imaging options. Yes. I think we're probably all pretty familiar with uh, CTs and MRIs, um, but PET scans seems to be kind of new to me, at least in the in this space. Can you talk about the promise that you referenced there and how that may impact either treatment options or measuring the efficacy of the whatever treatment's being pursued? Yeah, it's a great question, and. <laughs> One of the hardest things that we have right now is determining when you see a new finding. And I think as a patient or caregiver, you go to a visit and there is a small area that's lighting up that's maybe away from the original surgery or it's near the resection cavity and we're not really sure what it is. And we say, well, how about we get a scan in four weeks? How about we get a scan in eight weeks? And that can be anxiety provoking, understandably so, that you're just kind of waiting to see, is this gonna grow? Is it not gonna grow? You know, how, how do we make those determinations? Perfusion is one thing that people use. It's not validated. And what we use with perfusion is to see is there increased blood flow into that area. And you think about areas of high cellularity incre having increased perfusion. That's not 100%, but it's something that people use. Amino acid PET is also something where if there's enough tissue there with some of the new technology, they have... A lot of research has been done to say, you know, this area that's a hot spot on the PET may actually be tumor, and uh, the I think it's the FET amino acid PET has had the most promise uh, to help make those determinations. Again, it's not 100%, but it's another tool that you can use to hopefully make more timely decisions, because nobody wants to have to wait, especially with a disease with glioblastoma that, you know, four to eight weeks you know, could, could mean the difference between your tumor doubling in its size or not. And you really want to try to get ahead of it before something gets too large and it may take a surgical resection off the table, may take a laser ablation off the table. There's some options that, you know, you have to really consider. So that's one of the ones that has been considered. The problem with the amino acid PET has been it's not available at a lot of um, centers. So it's hard to kind of get a good validation of these modalities. I think the more, the more you have as far as imaging available to everywhere, you start to get better use cases, and you can start to see, is this actually going to help change treatment or not? So I think we'll hopefully get there, but you know, it's still taking some time. And I think artificial intelligence, I didn't talk about that, but there's a lot of interest in that as well. Uh, it's certainly being used in lung cancer and breast cancer with imaging. With brain cancer, the issue that we've run into is, again, the number of cases that uh, we can use and, and, and study to be able to make a good, effective determination of whether or not it's going to be helpful. I think, I think we'll get there. It just takes a really big collaborative group of centers to do this. So I think the, 
other plug I would say is the national organizations like the ABTA, like Sontag Foundation, they are actually doing a good job of trying to bring a lot of centers together to do maybe not work specifically on this, but in a lot of different areas like liquid biopsy or others to say, hey, let's get several of you to collaborate on something so that we can you know, look at more patients and say, is this something that we really should be pushing for our patients to be doing or getting other people behind? Other questions? Thank you for your question. Any other questions out there? Here you are. Thanks, Dr. Gia said. I just wanted to ask you, I've met a lot of patients here at this conference who say were diagnosed well before the change in the WHO guidelines in 2021 and say they were diagnosed in maybe 2014 with an anaplastic astrocytoma or something like that. So I guess my question to you is, <clears throat> As it relates to molecular testing, how long has that really been sort of standard? I mean, I realize it's going to vary from institution to institution, but, you know, and so for those patients who maybe don't know they're, you know, didn't have molecular testing, um, you know, do do you just, you know, wait, wait in, in the unfortunate event that it recurs, then you do the testing? I'm just kind of curious how those patients are managed that might not have had molecular testing and, and, you know, especially since the classification has changed. Sure. Thanks, Rebecca. That's a great question. I would advocate if the tumor has not been tested because I think probably we've seen it more mainstream since 2018, 2019, when, when uh, especially for outside vendors uh, like Foundation Tempest Cares, just to name a few, I'm not picking any of them for you know a specific reason, but once that started to have a little bit uh, easier approval through insurance, we started to see it a lot more. And honestly, since 2020, there has been really an explosion of uh, your brain tumor centers that are doing their own sequencing in-house as well. Uh, so I, I think that number now, you see a lot of patients are getting the molecular profiling done. But if you had not because you were diagnosed in years past, I would do it. I think that there's one thing I didn't touch on here, and that is uh, gliomas, glioblastoma in particular, is a heterogeneous disease. And it uh, is different both in time and space. And what I mean by that is the original tumor may look different at recurrence or progression. And different areas of the tumor may also look different. There may be a different molecular profile that's present. So it's important to just get a good understanding even before something happens to really know what does that tumor look like. And certainly when it's growing, getting that tissue profiled again to see what has changed. Maybe there's a different option as well. I think it's helpful to have the molecular profiling even if someone's tumor hasn't progressed because at least you start to think, are there options right now that I could consider for them if the tumor were growing? May help you make some decisions even when you have a situation like was asked earlier with imaging when you're like, I'm not really sure, but I have some concern. Maybe there is some option that you could consider for them where you feel like they'll be able to tolerate it well. And uh, you can start even before you're waiting for things to change. And uh, any other questions here in the room? I know, Heather, you have a couple on the app, but any any other questions here in the room? Um, I don't think you touched on this. Are, um, do you have treatment recommendations for ependymoma? Ependymoma, yeah, that's uh, that's a great question. and. I didn't touch on it, you're right. With ependymoma, it really depends on the location uh, to really determine, as well as the molecular profiling, which has really changed how ependymomas are treated. Uh, I think traditionally we kind of looked at giving radiation after surgical resection, but in certain cases, if there is the entire tumor that has visibly been removed, so what we call a gross total resection, some of those patients may be able to be observed and you don't have to necessarily give them radiation uh, and you kind of save that for recurrence. So I have several patients that have ependymomas and uh, a few of them had radiation after surgery, but there were several who we were able to avoid radiation and delay. I think if the question is getting at what type of chemotherapy would you use, that is a lot more difficult, I think, to really 
be able to tell you. And I could say that carboplatin is a, is a very reasonable option. Lapatinib is a reasonable option, which is CERN Foundation had a large study looking at lapatinib. Temozolomide is also used. Uh, and hopefully in the future, we're gonna have some more studies. Typically it's done by the CERN Foundation because that's such a rare disease that really requires multi-institutional studies. We'll be able to get some more information and see what other options are there. But for systemic, those are probably the three that I would think of just kind of off the top of my head. Thank you. Um, our next one is, can you address brain atrophy? Is that a radiation side effect? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And I would say that one thing that we see with radiation is scarring in the area that has been, uh, that has been treated. And there's going to be cancer that's obviously been treated, and it's also going to be some of the normal healthy tissue, unfortunately. And what you can see is as those cells scar and atrophy, as the question was being asked, is the volume decreases, so space has to occupy that volume, and you actually see the ventricle, if it's near a ventricle, start to enlarge in that area. So you may at times even see the, the term ventricular enlargement, and that is caused by some of the atrophy and scarring that happens in an area that's had radiation. And in fact, that's actually one of the tools that I use when I'm looking at uh, an MRI, especially for our lower grade gliomas that don't really have enhancing disease, so you're making, you know, your uh, your prediction of whether the tumor has grown or not really only off of non-enhancing changes. So if you have brain atrophy and ventricular enlargement, a lot of times you can feel more comfortable that this is probably scarring radiation effect, not 100%, but you use that as one of your thoughts. And if you actually see that the area is has non-enhancing change, but the ventricle is being pushed, it starts to make you think about mass effect and say that, no, this is actually probably more of a tumor growth and we need to consider getting tissue or moving right into treatment. So I hope that kind of answers the question. Um, I s suppose they could submit a follow-up question if, follow -up. if they have <laughs> need more information. Um, I just want to check the room and make sure there's no more in the questions in the room before I ask the next one. Okay. Um, for uh, pet imaging, what is the minimum size of lesion required? That's also a great question. We usually use one centimeter as the minimum, uh, although I think some of the techniques, the hope is that you can get down to five millimeters. Uh, I will tell you that with enhancing disease traditionally, we have, through the renal criteria, at least for MRIs, we think of progression or a new lesion as being greater than one centimeter in size. And they, uh, you know, for clinical trial purposes, that's what we use, although I will tell you it's not as easy in real practice because sometimes you may have an area that's not really a centimeter, but because of some of the other things you see on the MRI, you're pretty concerned. You're not going to wait. You're not going to say, well, the clinical trials tell me I should wait. No, you treat the patient. So, you know, historically that's the number, but hopefully we can improve that because, you know, we do have concerns sometimes even for a area that's growing that may not be a centimeter, you may want to uh, act now and not later. Um, and then the next question, um, can you speak more about the scope and process of molecular profiling? The scope and process, okay. So for molecular profiling, I'll just leave my slide there because I think the timing is really critical as well. There are certain mutations that most institutions are not doing. So IDH status should be done across the board at, at any place that you're seen. Uh, TERP mutation, I hope, is also being done at almost every place that you're being seen. But there's other things, other mutations, BRAF mutation. If you look at the treatment slide that I had put up earlier, some of those things are, are not really capable at other places. I'm trying to look for it. I'll leave it up for you. It's actually right after that. So what we would do is get tissue. If you can have an, if your center has in-house capability to do the molecular profiling, the timing may actually be done a little bit faster. So it may take two to three weeks, two to four weeks. Unless you're going for a clinical trial, 
that shouldn't hold anything up. So you shouldn't be waiting for the molecular profiling unless it was a question of uh, the case that I brought up afterwards where this, this patient, when they looked at the tissue, it looked like a low-grade tumor. You may have observed it. You may have said we don't need to do any treatment, but in fact, it was the profiling that came back. And that should really be back within four weeks because that actually did change the treatment for that patient. Some of the additional markers, the NTRAC fusions, BRAF fusions, for a higher grade glioma, we shouldn't be delaying chemo radiation to wait for those results. Patients getting started on treatment, what that's really doing is helping inform the decisions for later, for afterwards. If there's a change, what do I do next? That will be more helpful. But I don't want you to think that things like IDH status or TERT take four to six weeks. They should not because that usually happens Usually, seven to 10 days, I will tell you that it depends on staffing. You know, we're all kind of going through that, so it may up to two weeks, but again, up to two weeks, it really won't change uh, the treatment start for anyone. So at least it's still being done at a time where you can make uh, timely treatment decisions for patients. Thank you. Um, and another question is, um, will follow-ups and MRIs be lifelong if there's no cancer and the tumor is mostly removed? I do advocate for that. And I will tell you, even for a grade one pilocytic astrocytoma, which I didn't talk about, it's one of the most common uh, brain tumors in children. If it can be removed, you would hope it's surgically curable. In those cases, I still tell patients that I want to see you every two years. Because if you think about it, let's say you have a skin cancer, not a melanoma, and they take it out, you still get your skin checked. They don't tell you don't ever come back. Because there is a low likelihood, small possibility, that it could come back. And having checks is really important as part of your routine maintenance care, and that's part of survivorship. So for gliomas, depending on the grade, you may say, everything looks good, it's been 10 years, I'm doing fine, and we're talking about lower grade gliomas. There still is a possibility that it may grow, and I would argue in the diffuse gliomas, unfortunately that possibility is higher than what you would see with somebody who's a five-year breast cancer survivor. It doesn't mean that it's 100% you know, going to grow, but you wanna kinda of jump ahead of things. You don't wanna have someone who gets lost to follow-up and six years later, they have an area that has been growing slowly and now there's no surgery on the table. So we always tell patients, if you're doing well, you're five years out, you're six years out, at least having an annual scan just to make sure that we're not seeing any changes is really the, the safest option for patients. Um, and then can you provide more details on voracidinib? Would astrocytoma IDH mutant grade three benefit from it? So d again, this is my personal opinion. I would say yes, and I will give you the caveat for that. N Neural oncology, the community, has really started to rethink how we look at IDH mutated tumors. And what I mean by that is the grade two, grade three diagnosis doesn't necessarily change. The grade two, grade three diagnosis isn't really the same thing as what it meant before, now that we have IDH status out there. And we think that these are actually more of a homogenous group of tumors. So if you think about voracidinib having approval and being you know, an appropriate medication for patients who have grade two IDH mutated tumors, if you don't think about the grade two as much and just think about IDH mutated tumors in general, we do think after surgery, you know, these patients should also be appropriate candidates for having that drug, and I think it would be beneficial for them. The only patients where I would say I think you really need to go to chemo radiation is for those grade four IDH mutated tumors. Before we didn't have that classification, they were just called glioblastoma. Now we have this astrocytoma IDH mutated grade four tumor. I think for them, you still have to be pretty aggressive with using radiation and chemotherapy up front. But now we're starting to rethink, and I don't, I don't think we know all the details yet. Like we're not, as a community, agreed that if you have a grade three, maybe we can delay your chemo radiation. But most of us are thinking in that way and saying, let's first look at all of the patient factors, have a conversation with them and their family, 
and see if they would want to consider using uh, Vorsai's nib up front and follow them closely. And you know, I don't mind putting myself out there. That's actually how I talk to patients and have counseled several of these grade three patients. And we have another Vorsai nib question. Um, please discuss watch and wait versus chemo radiation or Vorsai nib in low grade tumors. Yeah. No, that's a great, I think it's going to be one of the hardest questions for us to kind of decide moving forward. I think watch and wait now is really going to be limited to a tumor that's been gross totally resected. Uh, I think in the lower grade IDH mutated tumors. I think when you have some residual disease, which previously, if they were a young patient, you would say, maybe that's somebody that I want to watch closely and delay chemo radiation because they're 25 and there's a little bit of tumor, but it may take five, 10 years to grow. That is the patient that should go on vorsitinib because you can delay the time to progression. The chemo radiation patients now would really be, you know, maybe you have a patient who didn't have surgery. They couldn't because of the location. It was a biopsy and there's a large low grade glioma there. They probably need chemo radiation, although you could argue that they also could be a candidate for vorsitinib if they don't have any symptoms and they really don't want to have chemo radiation because it's a two-way street. I may recommend chemo radiation to a patient who I think is a good candidate, and they might tell me no. So you have to work with them and find some common ground. They also still may be a candidate. I think chemo radiation now, though, for those patients are really meant for the patients that have failed the upfront vorsitinib. And then you would go on to, to more, I don't want to say definitive because definitive treatment makes you think that it's never coming back. You still have it in the back of your mind, but let's just say the more aggressive treatment that you know, has a different side effect profile. Um, we have a couple, I, you, I know you touched on clinical trials a little bit, and we have a couple of very specific questions uh, online okay. about um, finding clinical, or getting in the, sorry, about finding clinical sure. trials for their specific tumor type. Um, so rather than ask these uh, two very specific questions in here, can you um, just reiterate how patients can find clinical trials? Yeah. No, I think that's uh, extremely important. I'll put up this slide while I talk just so people have it. Um, so for clinical trials, and if I can, okay, this is the one. So. Clinical trials you can find on ct.gov. So if you go to the clinicaltrials.gov website, you can type in your tumor, you can say, I have a glioblastoma, and it'll give you, a, I'm newly diagnosed or in recurrence, and it's able to kind of show you all the different trials that are available. That can be overwhelming. It's overwhelming to me when my patient asks me, can you look at this for me and tell me what you think? Because there are so many that you look not enrolling close to accrual, so it can be very confusing for people. I think you should start with your care provider asking them, do you know of any studies? Most of the time they may know of some large trials that are being done around the country or in your region, they usually have some relationships with some of the, uh, the places that are close by and they can have some understanding of what's going on, but I do think that's where it's important for you to uh, also talk with the national organizations like the APTA, the Brain Tumor Network, and others because they have some of those relationships already with certain sites and they can be able to tell you based on this diagnosis, these are the, these are the open trials that are recruiting right now. And not only that, they may know the research coordinator and say, and I can contact them or I can put you in contact with them. Because ultimately, if you want to go somewhere else for a if a patient of mine wants to go get a clinical trial somewhere else, that's completely fine. I'm very supportive of it. You know, you're still, as, the, as a patient or family, you're still calling that center to talk with their clinical research coordinator. So you go on the website, you see where the trial is. Most like at our center, if you go on to our neurosurgery website, it'll say clinical trials, and you can click on it, and you can see all of the clinical trials that are available. It gives you the name of the investigator, but really the most important person is not the investigator, it's the clinical research coordinator, and it has their contact. That's the person that you're reaching out to who can look at eligibility 
and talk you through kind of what's going on and tell you whether or not you may be a candidate. I will just add that some centers will say uh, you'll need to come in for an evaluation before we can determine. Uh, I don't do that. Uh, most of most of what I've always done is, you know, if we think you're a candidate, uh, we say you need to come in because then we have to kind of go through that discussion. But if we can tell immediately that, well, based on this information, you would be a candidate, we tell you because we don't want people coming over with the hope of a trial when they're not really gonna be eligible. Although I always say, you're more than welcome always to come for another opinion, but based on the criteria you've given us, we don't think you're gonna be a candidate. And that's, that's just how we've operated because I think it's uh, being respectable of, of, of people who wanna travel for, for these opportunities because there's not many and you don't wanna delay someone's time by coming to your office and you say, oh, you're not eligible. All right, well, that is all the time we have for questions right now. I wanna say a, a hearty thank you to Dr. Giaseddin for this wonderful session, Treating My Tumor. Uh, I have some additional great news in addition to the resources that uh, Dr. Ashley pointed us to. Lunch is now available in the hallway outside of the main session ballroom. Uh, you are welcome to eat in the ballroom itself. Uh, if you have any type of dietary restriction and you don't see food that's compatible with that, please uh, let our staff know and we can connect you uh, with the banquet captain here at the conference center. Also, please take your time um, during the lunch break to visit the exhibit booths and uh, have your name badge scanned and you'll earn uh, stamps for our passport contest. And then after lunch, our second set of breakout sessions on this Saturday will resume at one o'clock for those outside of the central time zone. That's one o'clock central. And again, thank you for everyone's participation and enthusiasm. And again, thank you, Dr. Ashley. We really appreciate it. Thank you. I'll stay around if anybody has questions.